all humans. Hey. What up, Hop? Hello there. <laughs> Hello. Um, I think it's going to be a, a long conversation. So let's just start with your version of just how we even got here. Like not the drama, but just in terms of, because we haven't, prior to the end of last year, we hadn't talked for literally like five years. Like hadn't seen each other, hadn't talked. Yeah, yeah. Like 2016, um, 17, 18. Or it was almost like four. It was four years, about a solid four. Okay, so now it's been five. But yeah, like, now it, it's been five, but it was a solid four when I yeah. But um, yeah, literally didn't cross paths, <clears throat> didn't didn't speak, didn't see each other. Yeah. Um, so I, I think it makes sense to just talk about like how did we even? Because I I honestly didn't think I wasn't I wasn't waiting on a phone call. I wasn't. Yeah. You know, I didn't think that it that that we would talk. I just kind of pushed past it. Yeah. Well, yeah, it was last, it was December 2019, and I, um, I was in a, at a really low point, a super, super, super low point where I, I felt, I was just super emotional and depressed, and yeah, I just felt like the outcome of my life wasn't what I had expected it to be, you know, um, and it just got me thinking, it just got me reflecting on, on my past and a lot of things that I've done and just reflecting on people that I've had around me in the past who were no longer here. And I was just thinking like, man, cause I, I'm, I'm, I've been going through a, a tough situation in a certain area that I don't want to discuss right now, but it just got me thinking like, I don't want to ever make anybody feel this way whether I've done something wrong to them or they've wronged me and, and there's a grudge between us or whatever. So I just realized that I was like, man, I don't, I don't want, I just want peace. Like I actually want peace and love. I don't want to contribute to anybody feeling this way. And I also don't want anybody in, you know, that I stumble across in the future to ever want me to feel this way. And then um, I just felt the need to call you. I was just like, damn, Some, it, it, it was, I didn't expect it. Like when I woke up that morning, it wouldn't have, I didn't necessarily think that I was going to be calling Dan. I really didn't know I was going to, and I didn't care to call you that morning, but that evening it hit me and I, I just felt a strong desire to call you and just like apologize. And when I called you, I know I was like crying and super emotional and it was, you know, just due to just everything. Like I said, the outcome of my life was just very, very um, painful at the time. And my perspective was very blurred. So when I called you, I just wanted, yeah, I was, I was pretty much just broken down at my lowest and I just wanted to make peace with you. And that's when I, uh, yeah, I, I don't remember exactly what I said verbatim, but I know is, I know, um, I, I I started it off with sorry. I'm genuinely sorry or something like that. It was yeah. Nah, it was so. My phone rang. I I'm I typically work on my on my couch in the living room and like my phone rang. I looked at. It, I ain't seen your name in the phone hell long. I thought it was like <laughs> in my mind when I seen it. I was like, damn, was that a butt dial? Was that really hot? Yeah. And then I and then you know obviously picked up the phone and I think we talked for like an hour. And it was it was a dope conversation. Like it was it was definitely healthy. Um, you know, I ultimately, given how the conversation went, you know, I was I was glad to hear from you. Yeah. Um, you know, I wasn't anticipating a phone call, um, but I, I'm glad you called. And then, you know, obviously we we, we set up a a time to meet. I think two days later, it was, I think you called me on like a Monday, and we met on a Wednesday. Yeah. We met at Whole Foods, and. Um, talk for like three hours like two or three hours mm -hmm. just kind of catching up on you know the, the, the past just, four years yeah for the most part um so that that's that's ultimately how it happened and you know we 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 wanted to do this a lot earlier in the year obviously covid with some setbacks and you were traveling um you know but i but i also needed some time to kind of make sure that this was like this was like a real genuine. Yeah, yeah, not some. I I understand you know? that. I feel that. So I so I'm glad it wasn't like any rush to social media. There was no, you know. So even when people see this, like, just know that there's been almost we, a year now. Yeah, pretty much a, a year. Yeah, that we've been cool. 
and been civil with each other and yeah. So, so yep. now, you know, I, I want to explore, obviously I think people are most interested in the drama, but you know, first thing I want to, I want to talk about like why we're on camera having this conversation publicly, like what do we hope to get out of it? Right. Mm -hmm. Um, so from yours, I mean, cause I probably have about five or six reasons, but yeah, yeah. From, from your standpoint, like what do you think, you know, will come um, out of the conversation? Well, I mean, I, I know we kind of prior discussed this prior, but I, I, I am a firm believer that it's, it's important to be transparent, like fully transparent in a situation like this, because we were in a really good position back then and people really don't like, yeah, they've heard my story and they heard your story and we've done like some radio interviews, but for us to have this conversation to be sitting here right now, I think is just important for people, you know, who are in situations like what we had to, to see us as like, just be adults and sit down and, and, and speak about this stuff. Even if some stuff does get uncomfortable or whatever it is, it's just important to have these kind of conversations. And yeah, I want people to just kind of learn from our mistakes, you know, whether, whether it was certain moments where one of us may have been too emotional or whatever, whatever it was, I want them to see stuff like this so they can be like, damn, that's exactly like, what I'm doing, what and and let me not do that now. I'm glad that they said that because that really hits home, you know. So I, yeah, I I I just believe in transparency on such a level because I feel like you don't really see that much. You don't see it that much in the music industry where there's always like um some type of smoke and mirrors game going on, or you never really know what happened with the situation of why this group isn't together no more or whatever. You just mainly hear like whatever rap song came out about it and somebody said, fuck that person. And you don't really get to see them all sit down and discuss the details. So right. that's why I feel it's important so people can learn from it. Yeah, and I think for me, I mean, I agree with that as well, but I think, you know, in, in addition to that, um, you know, it's just, just our relationship. Cause I think as we talk about the story of Funk Volume, um, and I think even doing it now is different than doing it three years ago or four years because given that we're five years removed and different things have happened and we've had different experiences, we might even, th we probably would look at it different than if we talked about it right away. Yeah, yeah. Like, since we've had time to like really reflect and see how things play out, you know, I think we would have just a better perspective on things. But yeah. You know, obviously, since Funk Volume ended, you know, I, I do a, pa a passion project of mine is the Music Entrepreneur Club, which we talk about the business on a week on a weekly basis. Mm -hmm. um, I think this will be great knowing that I'm still connecting to artists that are trying to work things out with business people and, and, and still having some tension. I think that they'll, they'll learn a lot from this conversation. Yeah. Um, but I think first and foremost, I think it's about our relationship and, and just kind of going forward. Um, cause I think that our perspectives may have changed about some, thir some, some things and maybe yeah. they, maybe they stayed the same. Mm -hmm. Um, but I, I think it, I think it's healthy to, to have the conversation and given the fact that it ended publicly, um, we can resolve it publicly or, or at least talk about some things. Cause right. I, 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 I do believe like, yeah, if, if, if there was such a, especially on my be on my part, there was such a big missile launched to end and destruct the situation, I can put that same effort in to, you know, kind of heal the situation or, or, you know, bring some kind of um, closing to it where it can, there can be peace. And I, and I can commend that how, cause like I said, I wasn't, I was never expecting a phone call from you. Like I, I, I wasn't, I, I wasn't either. <laughs> I, I, like I, I it, it was such a, it was such a transitional moment in that, like when that happened, because it was that evening, I was like, if, let's just say if someone <laughs> had a, approached me earlier in the day, it was like, hey man, what's up with Dame? I would have been like, man, I don't give a fuck about no goddamn Dame. <laughs> but something in the universe, it just, I like, I don't know, I was able to see myself and it was like, yo, you don't really like having issues with people. Why are you putting up this front that like, stop trying to be the tough guy and just really be who you really would like to be. And that was just one of those moments where I was like, because yeah, I, I just, like I said, it was my instinct telling me to do that. It, it I didn't, I didn't know it was going to happen. And But I, I commend that growth because like, 
I don't think I've ever heard you apologize to me or to anyone. I like, no, I apologize all the time. <laughs> like, you, you, you hop, hop will be the type of cat. You have your water right here. Hop, come by, knock it down. No, and I'll be like. Yo, that is not like, true. He'd be like, "Why you had a water at the end of the table?" Then no, why, no, why? no, no. Some situations I may have that response, but no, 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 no. <laughs> no, nah, but seriously, like, I definitely commend the growth. I, I, I appreciate you know at least being in, in in contact with you again. You know, I mean, I don't, I don't have relationships like that. Like, I don't have that type of relationship with anybody that looks at me the way that you portrayed in the public. Like, like literally I don't have anybody to, to have this conversation and to hopefully, you know, educate each other on, yeah. on, on how we were feeling. Because from my perspective, and, and again, we'll get into it, like, yeah. you know, it wasn't just about the, like there was build up, there, there was, was frustration, it, there was tension from probably day one. And I, it, it, we'll talk about it, but I, I could probably identify those things like in hindsight, Yeah, you know, I didn't think it would end so abruptly and so fast. And even, you know, when things did transpire in the end, like I was like, ah, oh, he he gonna come back to reality. Like we gonna we gonna be cool. Yeah. Um. So I want to talk about like, you know, people are gonna want to jump into the drama, but uh -huh. I want to talk about prior to me even getting involved. Like, yeah. So 2007. So I got involved in 2008. So yeah. 2007. I, we hadn't met yet, but I had heard. Your, my brother showed me your CD, LAUSD result. Yeah, yeah. This was probably like, when did you make that? that I mean, I made it around 2000. It, it, it's just been, it was just a compilation CD that has been pretty much made from 2004 to 2007 seven or something like that. Like, it was just, I can't remember the exact date, but yeah. Yeah, because I, I mean, obviously I wasn't in music at all. Like, I was in school. I was working overseas, came back, went to business school. So I, yeah. was in, I was in the corporate world, but I knew my brother had a homie that rap, uh -huh. and he had, and that when I played, I was like, okay, I, I can, I can see, you know, why you're, you were getting some of the traction you were getting at the time, why you got signed to Ruthless. But yeah. what did, what did 2007, 2008 prior to Dame, like, what is, what does that look like for you? Um, well, yeah, I was signed to Ruthless, and um, I was dealing with another Dame. <laughs> we won't go into that. Um. <laughs> Oh, uh, but yeah, it was, um, overall it was shitty. It was super shitty because, you know, I got signed. And of course, when you get a record deal, you think that everything's just about to change. And I did get money. I got signed for, um, it was a hundred grand total, but I got 40, I got like 50 up front and then 50 after the album was turned in. This was the album Gazing at the Moonlight. And, you know, they had, you know, I, I just eventually saw that. Um, Tamika Wright may have not known what the best moves were f to make for for my career. Mm -hmm. It seemed like there were a lot of confusion. There was a lot of confusion with how to market me, or but it seemed like other stuff was going on that may have not been said to me, and I didn't know what it was, and it just caused me to be confused, which ultimately caused me to be enraged, and then put and then vocalize this in my music and put it out to the world and but and you came along during that phase but yeah but, but prior to you like i said it was just um me so, my career just being stagnant nothing happening and i was on my space just trying to figure it out so tell like educate the people that don't know like what was funk volume at that time so i mean funk volume originally was going to be my secondary alter ego rap name which was um which would have been whack as hell so I'm glad it wasn't that. But then Swizz, me and Swizz have known each other since, um, you know, high school, 10th grade or something like that. And we used to freestyle. So, when, you know, we, we always kept in touch and he would come over to my house, you know, um, after we all got out of high school and we would make songs and stuff. And then me and him just, like, I remember he presented the idea like, yo, what if we, because he loved the name Funk Volume. Mm -hmm. And, he, and he, had, he, had, he was like, yo, what if we just like, made a label or something or we just start repping the name funk volume like as a as a as a crew or something and i was like i'm I'm down and you know at the time i didn't think it was going to be anything major because i was signed to ruthless and i'm thinking that that was going to be my jump off in my career right and then but being swiss yeah we just started putting out music and making little videos shooting little bootleg videos you know in the early stages of youtube 
and hoping something works. And we was only getting 200 views a month, you know, something like that. And then, but I know he would mention you like every now and then he'll bring you up saying that you were this um, super um, educated business guy who went to college. And I, I didn't really know what that meant. I'm just like, okay. And he's like, yo, he could probably help us. So I'm like, um, okay, cool. But yeah, but I know we, um, I can't remember if we were doing those little hip hop shows where we would go to battles. Remember that? Was that, was that, I, I don't yeah. know if that was, I think that was when we, when we were all, all three of us were working together. But yeah, we used to do those hip, those hip hop shows. And we used to always win. And then sometimes we, <laughs> yeah, I remember one time and there was, it ended bad in Pasadena with the dude who stole some money. Right. But so, yeah, so that was when I, I got, that was when I was involved. So I got involved in like 2008. Um, my brother brought me in. So Swizz, for, for those that don't know. Um, yeah. So at the end of 2008, I was working for a company called Deloitte Consulting. I had graduated from business school um, in 2007. Um, so I wasn't, it wasn't like I was trying to get into music. It wasn't like music was a huge passion. Like, oh, let me get into the music industry. Like I was pure corporate, you know, none of, none of, I went to to Stanford, like nobody Stanford business school goes into music really. Like it wasn't yeah. anything that I had planned. Um, you know, then Justin hit me and was like, yo, you know, I think you should talk to Hop cause you know, I'm taking the, the music more serious. He was at UC Irvine at the time. And that's when we connected and was like, okay, let's let's just figure this out. And only because it lined up with when I got laid off did I have the time to like really think about this seriously. Yeah. So, you know, we connected, eventually decided to um come together and start funk volume. And we it couldn't be a record label at first. It was more we positioned it more of like a marketing and production company because you yeah. still signed a ruthless. Uh-huh. Exactly. But yeah. let's 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 talk about like that first, um, you know, how we negotiated, because I know even to this day, you still may not be happy with how things got split from the jump. And this may be the first, that may be the first building block. Um, no, that that wasn't, that like, I, I, I can I can probably like pinpoint the year that may be the first building block that contributed to, I guess, the negative side of things. I couldn't pinpoint the moment, but I just know maybe like the year, but that didn't, that definitely didn't. That was a, that was a moment where I was kind of confused because I didn't know business myself. Right. So, um, yeah, but I guess what you're saying, the, the, the start of that, when we started Funk Volume, I remember I went to you guys' house and we were talking at the table and you were asking me what I think the like percentages should be or how involved I would like you to be. Mm -hmm. And I think at first I said like a super low percentage for you because right. I, but I didn't understand business at all, so I didn't. Right. So I'm, I'm a but, just. But I and I didn't understand the music industry. Yeah, so I, yeah. I, you share your perspective because yeah, yeah. I think this is healthy, even you know, for for artists that. Uh, no, you're you right. Know, you're right. So no. So here, here's how it was because I remember, um, you know, I, I was just always under the impression that you know, the, the artist is just the, the the breadwinner, the one who does it all, and then and me producing all this, so I'm just like, you know, I'm um. This is this is my thing. This is all mine, all mine, mine. And it was it was a selfish way of thinking because I didn't understand ways that you could contribute or Swiss. I knew you guys could contribute, but I was just it was more of a subconscious ego thing. But I didn't know it existed. It's just I think every artist starts off that way, just not right. knowing the industry. So I um I I remember I I you because you I think you had mentioned something like fifty fifty, and I was just like I I, I was totally against that right. because I thought that. Like, yeah, it, it just didn't sound right. And then um, I was, I remember I said something maybe like 15 or 25% yeah. or something like that. Yeah. And that would, um, and yeah, and 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 then I think, I, I forget how that conversation ended that day, but I know with time, of course, I eventually understood things a little more. And, um, but so, yeah. So ultimately we decided to to split the business 50 50 right? yeah so our ownership in the business is 50 50 yeah but you're still so that doesn't mean i make half of what you make yeah that, yeah. Just, that means the business is 50 50 but mm -hmm. you as an artist would be signed to the label and would have you know yeah uh, royalty splits and percentages yeah know, as, yeah as an artist so I, right? yeah so then i i learned to split myself into two people as to marcus right. hops in the the business owner and then hops in the rapper 
Right. So that's how I, yeah, and that's how I compartmentalized it in my mind. And and I understood that and, I, and that made sense. At first I was a little iffy because, you know, when you, you got people in your ear too who are like, man, what? You the artist, man. You doing right. all this, man. You don't even, what the heck, man? You right. deserve like, man, you should be getting like 90%. Though. Do you make that beat? Man, you make that shit hot. You don't need to. And then right. you get a lot of that in your ear and then it, it, it boosts up your ego. So you start to really think like, I'm going to give this motherfucker 3%. <laughs> like, and you really think that because they, and then you realize that that's not realistic because how else is anyone going to live? Right. You know? So there's that. Yeah. And I, and you used to, you used to throw out like, like scenarios where like, <laughs> well, what if I sell a beat to Dr. Dre for a million dollars? How much do you get of that? Like, I, I think a lot of artists have <laughs> like, here, here's where I think there's a disconnect between artists and business people. Like when artists come to the table, they're negotiating off a best case scenario because they know they're going to blow, right? Like yeah, they, yeah. and this may not even be you, but just in general, like yeah. when an artist comes to the table, they're like, okay, I know I'm going to blow. Uh -huh. So I'm worth a mil, yeah. right? Whereas the business person or the label might be like, okay, there's a percentage, they're doing more of an expected value cal calculation. Yeah. Like there's, there's, a, there's a possibility you are worth a million. But then there's also a possibility that you lose us money. Yeah, or you yeah, make exactly. zero, mm -hmm. right? So instead, and make I'm super simplifying this, but like, so instead of giving them a million, there's fifty percent chance that you do make a million, fifty percent chance you make nothing. We're gonna offer them five hundred thousand because that's the expected bat. Like they business people look at it more like that, whereas yeah. like the artists in their mind they know. Yeah, they're yeah, selling exactly. they're, They know that they're going to get the million from Dr. Dre for his, for their beats or their song. Like they they know they're going to blow. And yeah, I, and you, I don't know if you can relate to that or if that's it's, just. An, it's a, I mean, artists. Of course, every artist thinks that they're special and they feel like they're unique and they got what it takes to become famous. So, or or you know, get their music out there. So yeah, I mean, I I thought that of course, um, coming up. But yeah, you just you. It's a selfish way of thinking. It's just the it's the ego is blocking everything, so you can't see clearly. And yeah. when you just get, you know, kids from the streets who, you know, I, I was a little skateboarder. And my I didn't I didn't know business at all, like nothing. I didn't even when, though I was signed to Ruthless, no one ever sat me down and said, "Hey, this is how it works." I'm only going off of what I heard Fifty Cent say or Eminem say in a song or or whoever, and that's the best I can do, you know. And that and right. at that time, that's that's his deep as I can go with my consciousness on understanding how the finances work in a, in a business. So my ego is, in, you know, my ego is in front of a lot of that, but with time I learned to understand. So, so technically just to break it down for people, like, you know, if we own the business 50, 50, let's just say the artist puts out a, an album and on that album, it's, it's fit. It's a 50, 50 split, 50 to the artist, 50 to the label. Yeah. Right. So you put out an album, let's just say it makes a hundred dollars. 50 goes to the artist, 50 goes to the label, but mm -hmm. we own the label 50-50. So it's kind of like 25, 75 yeah, yeah. for an album that's fit for an album that's 50-50. Yeah, no, it is. It is. So so it's that awesome. hopefully, again, simplifying the numbers. Um, but what so even so we we split the business 50-50. Yeah. What did you think were your responsibilities as co-owner in the label? Like My, going forward when we start. Mm -hmm having artists like what in your mind what were your responsibilities my responsibilities were all the creative stuff like the, the the visuals the beats the production understanding all of that understanding mixing and mastering whatever that was i didn't even know at the time um just being on top of the creative stuff it was i was gonna handle just like 100 percent of every all the creative things of of you did you would have never had to worry about who's gonna edit the videos and who's going to shoot them or worry about the cameras, all that. I was just going to take care of all of that. And you, you know, and the, the trade-off, of course, or your, the, you, you know, your end of the bargain is you do all the business stuff, like the website, because I didn't know anything about websites, understand that. And I didn't have the patience to want to understand. Right. And the analytics behind whatever it was, YouTube or any, whatever anything was online, like even Facebook. I didn't get a Facebook until I know you had really convinced me to get on there. Right. which turned out to be a great thing for me, but I didn't, I would have never done it. And I probably would have still had my space to this day right. promoting myself. So yeah, it's just, you were, yeah, you were going to take care of the, the marketing side the, of, of strategies that we could come up with to market ourselves online while I take care of the, 
just the product to right. to market. So so yeah, so I mean for the most part that's right. But what I would also say, like I I, I put up, you know, it wasn't yeah, like did. a certain amount. It wasn't like a, a I ended up probably spending, I would say like twenty grand over the first couple years. Yeah. Like totally. Right. I didn't spend that much money. Yeah. Like I I know I bought your camera. Mm-hmm. I know that I gave you some money from time to time for rent. Yeah, you did. Um, you... I paid for the website, paid for merch to get to get made, stuff like that. Yeah, and and for like the business to actually get set up, like legally, <laughs> you know, the, the proper. Yeah, way. yeah, all the yeah, the tech. Um, yeah, yeah, so, I, I remember that. That's factual. So, so yeah, and then you know, <clears throat> just being with you guys, just going to those those little those little shows. Yeah, yeah. Um, and just, but I I what I also did was I just spent a lot of time just kind of like learning the business. Like I was. So I was a consultant right before, and what that means is like, you know, I worked with companies in different industries. So I was used to getting thrown into a different industry and like having to figure stuff out. Yeah. Um. So, but I spent a lot of time just like, okay, how how does this work? Okay, fans are the most important. Let's just figure out how to how to get more fans. It's a pretty simple business when you really think about it. Yeah. Um. You know, but you know, just understanding that fan fans were the most important. Let's figure out where we should be. Where we should put the music? Can we? I went to some stupid conferences, wasting mm-hmm. my time. Like, <laughs> I remember. Like, <laughs> I, I, I was like, I was like at that time. I think the I think the worst fifty dollars I've ever spent was like paying somebody at an Urban Network conference to listen to your guys' music. Yeah, that's some bullshit. A, <laughs> I, I remember those. I, I remember those. I, yeah, in a room, and they they listened to it, and they were like, "Ah, oh, that's nice." I was, like, <laughs> I was like, "That's it." Wow. Um, yeah. Damn. So, so yeah, like I I was tasked the mistake that I made in the very beginning was like, you know, coming into it not and and I was like, you know, that's just Dame the business guy. He doesn't really know anything about music, and at the time I didn't. Yeah. However, when you sit with music day in and day out and you start interacting with fans day in and day out, you start going to your guys' shows and you see how people are responding to certain parts of the of the songs or certain parts of the performances like i i think i built up over time an opinion that it, that at least should be more valued but i threw that card away in the beginning because you were cuz i was just like right i am the, the business guy i don't really know i don't really know anything about music <laughs> yeah yeah so that that was that was a, a mistake because then you guys passed that sentiment on to dizzy and like he didn't value my opinion either like but i felt like eventually i had eventually i felt like i had an opinion that at least should be listened to at some point but anyway yeah, like I agree. so, I so agree. that so that was that was my my role at least at the time because we didn't have any other artists so yeah. that was kind of like all of the stuff that i did in the very beginning so i would say for about you know to how, how long when did you when did we when did we get you out of ruthless oh it was it was it was like the same year raw came out 2010 i think that was that was when it um I think like sometime earlier before Raw came out in November of 2010. Right. So that so that's two years. So what what other stuff were we were doing around there? We were doing like Wait, we we dropped we did the funk volume mixtape. We um Haywire. Haywire. We had Haywire, and we we did a few con- we did some contest. Um, I think but, I don't I don't remember what the con. Oh, were we gonna sign? It? I don't remember. Are we oh, gonna that. sign. It? <laughs> <laughs> so we did. Yeah. So. <laughs> the don't the don't fuck up our beats contest got started with well that was an idea of mine because yeah. like sometimes you would be going through your personal stuff and my brother wasn't creating uh-huh. so I would be frustrated as shit like okay like all right I jumped into this and I yeah. wasn't so I wasn't doing funk volume a a hundred percent day in and day out because it wasn't making any money so yeah. I was I was also substitute teaching uh-huh. I was uh, consulting for a company called Yowie. And then um, another company that that ran like events or whatever. Yeah. So that's what I did to kind of keep paying mm-hmm. my bills and and keep keep things float. But you know, I was steady kind of studying of how to get this shit off the ground. Yeah. Uh. So for two years, what else did we do? We did uh the, the funk volume wait, TV. The uh. Wait, what was what is the little you stream and live stream shows? Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, oh yeah, we did do on, that. On we a did. weekly basis. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then um, oh yeah, we did we did do that. <laughs> So we did though. And you always used to turn your hat every time you talk. You would <laughs> spin your hat around the full helicopter about ten times throughout that whole life. I don't remember that, but I remember. <laughs> but yeah, so we were we were doing the live stream stuff super early. Um, 
yeah, then, and then when I knew Facebook was going to be a thing, I kind of forced you guys to get on Facebook. Yeah, um, which turned out to be really like a, a home for our fans at the time. Oh, yeah, like Fa- was, Facebook. Yeah. Facebook is, I mean, really, there's, a, there's a lot of reasons that we had success, but Facebook is definitely, yeah. definitely one of them. But yep. this was like early Facebook where it was easy. I mean, I still think artists should be on Facebook. I don't think yeah. artists should have been on Facebook, but like this is like it, Facebook now is what TikTok is today because a lot of people are getting big off tiktok with just yeah. a few posts or whatever yep um you know the algorithm was less strict mm-hmm. um yeah so it yeah was easier to to talk to people a lot more time. interaction organic interactions as well even 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 our fans were friends of each other like they our fan bases became they started following each other amongst each other because they had funk volume in common and they yeah right so it was a no yeah. we we did a hell of a job at like <clears throat> building community and i think that's important even today is like you're gonna be successful and have a long career if you're able to build a community and i think that that early you stream live stream stuff that contributed to it all the interaction on facebook that contributed to it yeah the merch the contest um we even had a street team we had a funk volume street team yeah that was online it was an internet street team but like each each city had like a group um you know so that made it that made it spread faster your music resonated with an audience that i wasn't familiar that i wasn't familiar with i wasn't familiar with them either (laughs) i'm gonna let you know that i mean it was a beautiful thing because they were they were they were instrumental in in our success but i wasn't aware of what a juggalo was neither was i (laughs) i I thought my fan base i thought my fan base was gonna be a bunch of Super hip hop East Coast hood niggas who respected <laughs> my skill level of putting together syllables and words. Pretty much what I saw in Eight Mile in the crowd, <laughs> I thought that w- those type of people would be my fans, right. and it was not that at all. No, I was, yeah. I it was a different, which is fine. They're mm-hmm. still human beings, but I just yeah, but I just um, yeah, it, it, I was like, oh, this is okay, all right. Hip hop. But but it was it was dope though because like I think that you can jump some steps or speed up your success if you tap into like micro communities that already exist. Right? Yeah. The juggalo com- the juggalo <laughs> community they already had like chat rooms. They all, yeah. they were already connected. So if like one one person liked it, it was gonna spread like wildfire. Yeah, yeah. And they I, I mean they were primarily like our, our no they our were first they fans. were the, they were the shout out to the juggalos they were definitely like they are the reason like they were the platform of my fan base that created me to help me get to where i'm at because yeah they yeah they ate they ate up my music like crazy i think i wonder if i didn't wear the white contacts would they have i wonder if it was the contacts that did it or was it just the sound because like what if i just had like a yeah i don't know i always just wonder like because i know the contacts like seem like wicked and horrorcore. I think I right. wonder if I didn't have men and I would just have like a pretty boy image where they'd be like, I'm not listening to this bullshit. Right. I don't yeah. know. But anyways. I, I I don't know. Um but so we so you put out we got you out of Ruthless, Ruthless in two thousand ten, you said? Yeah, that was um like yeah, sometime two thousand ten, yep. And then we put out raw and then we put out raw. Mm-hmm. Right. Yep. And then you and I had an agreement on Raw. What? Oh, we did. So what was that agreement? I don't remember. No, so because I had been working for pretty much two years. And oh we, yeah, we didn't yeah. make any. We didn't make any money. Mm-hmm. So our first. So your that album was was supposed to be split fifty fifty. Like not oh, yeah. not in the sense that I explained about ten minutes ago. Yeah. That we had an agreement that that was going to be split fifty fifty. Yeah. Like fifty to me, fifty uh-huh. to you. Just given the fact that I had been working. Yeah, yeah. You know, I understand. And and I and I think another thing that I want even you to to understand is like, I spent twenty thousand, but I was making a hundred and twenty thousand at my last job. Uh-huh. So I just want you to understand like how I looked at what I was doing. Yeah, right? yeah. So like if I'm making 100 if I was making 120,000 and now I'm making, you know, whatever 20, to make 20 to make grand. no, that's down. That's so a, there's an opportunity <clears throat> to me I'm putting in like 100 grand yeah, a yeah, year. Yeah. You know, so this is this is my sweat equity, this is my investment. And it was hard for me in the beginning to like 
I even created a separate Facebook page because I knew my my like my community wouldn't yeah. understand what I was doing. <laughs> like when I posted, when I would post your music, like I knew that like my business school classmates like I'd be like, okay, what what do you? And to be honest, and to just to be completely a hundred with you, like it was because I came from you know Stanford is arguably the best business school in the world. Yeah, these, these cats, you know, they came out. A lot of them came out running hundred, you know. Ten million dollar companies, whatever, uh-huh. and I'm over here messing like it just was. So it was hard for me to kind of swallow like what I would like. I believed in what we were doing. Yeah, I definitely yeah. believed in it. But, but in the early stages, it looks it looks weird because from that the perspective. stuff we was doing, the stuff we was doing, didn't look Total, like no, the stuff looked, we was doing. It looked like yeah. some bootleg whack <laughs> shit. That's like what the fuck. I would have thought the same thing. Like this, what this man doing? He went to college all these years, and right. he fucking with this this dude wearing white contacts, making oh. a fool of himself. Talking right. shit in music, yeah. So the, I mean, you should remember the Halloween party. Oh like my god, the Halloween! I got part. pictures of that. <laughs> so it was. <clears throat> I mean, eventually I got comfortable with it. And I I had to because I believed in what we were doing, but I I just want to share my perspective because you know you know fast forward five years you know when when somebody says things to me like oh you don't deserve or even your fans <clears throat> now like a lot of them still you know call me names or tell me what I did did or didn't do. Like I was here from 2008. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. Like I was driving y'all around, you know, figuring out stuff. Like this wasn't somebody who just hopped on. I know. In, I remember in 2014 and just rode the wave. Yeah. Like you know, I put in, I put in my work. I sacri. I mean, and I it's a self sacrifice. Like I, I could have went back into the working world and just made, you know, and progressed and whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's my choice at the end of the day, but. You know, I definitely wasn't somebody that just sat back. I mm-hmm. mean, we had a cool little merch set up at the house. Like, yeah, we were I... sending stuff out. Like, it was for a three man team. Like, we was, you know, we was doing some stuff. And when we put out Raw, I think that was the game changer. Yeah, no, that that's well, what... that was game changer number one. Yeah, yeah, that was that was the first. Yeah, that. But there was there was a lead up to it because I think we mixed the, with the Haywire mixtape. We put that out free to help build the buzz. Right. We shot a few videos to that. With to help build the buzz, you know they didn't they they didn't get crazy views, but that so before at the time bro, it was no for for something yeah no it was it was but we were getting like maybe yeah I feel like it was pulling like ten ten thousand views maybe a month or wow. which was a lot for us because we had nothing so um and all we had I mean I had pans in the kitchen which was the hottest joint that had ever you know hit <laughs> television um what was it music choice pans in the kitchen mm-hmm. yeah. But my buzz had fallen off, gazing at the moonlight flopped, and you know, haywire dropped, and that's yeah, we were picking up the pieces. But yeah, then that led up to Raw. Raw definitely mm-hmm. did change everything for us at that at that time. And I remember when we dropped the album, um, because I was broke, broke. So you making a hundred and some thousand a year. I mean, I did get like two separate checks of fifty grand from Ruthless, but that started in two thousand seven. That shit was gone, mm. like. That I mean, it, it lasted me like two years. I I, I held on to it for a That's long. It's amazing time. that it lasted that long. I I didn't spend. I didn't buy nothing but a couple noodles and and <laughs> and music equipment. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, and and I remember we didn't know how to tour at all. Like that was just foreign to us completely. I remember I made a post on Facebook because we didn't know what we anything. So I was just I think we had to come to a conclusion. I don't remember what the discussion was, but. I made a post on Facebook saying, who wants me to come to their city? Put your city below or whatever, or link us with a with a club promoter, something, because we didn't know, but I think I painted it as if we were going to come to their city if they just commented, but it was really just gauging where we should go, and I I don't think, how did we even find out about club promoters? I don't, I don't. Yeah, no, nah, so, so yeah, that's right. So <laughs> what we did, um, because I think at that point we had established a relationship with Strange Music because we had done like some one-off shows with like Stevie Stone. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, and 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 when we went there, you know, that's when we met Tech and we met Travis. So we had a little bit of a relationship. So mm-hmm. when we were about to tour. I hit him up and asked him for his like standard agreement. Oh yeah, Cause, yeah. Because you know, I didn't, you know, I didn't know yeah, what yeah. how to. So that's how we just started you know, doing our own deals with promoters and we, we basically booked our own tour. Yeah. Um, and just hit the road. And, you know, some of the shows was cool. Some of the shows was super dope. Some of them were really bad. Some of them, some of them had like 
seven, ten people. Right. Yeah. But it wasn't, you know, like to find where your fans initially were, it was in LA. Right. It, it was it was not. No, it was not. <laughs> um it was in the Midwest more, like like Cleveland. Right. Um and like Michigan certain places in Michigan, like around Detroit and where was it? Um Denver, Denver. was Denver was that was my first that was like on the first tour. I feel like that was the first show that I did that had five hundred people. Right. That was on the first tour, the raw tour too. Yeah. And I'll yeah, I'll never forget that. Um yeah. I think and I I tweeted about this not too long ago too, because <clears throat> it's like I knew that we weren't gonna get LA's initial support, you know, being from the valley, you know, for, for people that don't know, it's not like in the city city. Like it's still considered LA. Um, you know, but it we were we would never be considered like you know, LA. We wouldn't yeah. be accepted by the traditional LA coach, nor did we make the have a traditional LA sound. Yeah, didn't at all. Um, Still you know, don't. Uh, I mean, I think you have a lot of West Coast influences. Yeah, like yeah, Dre for sure, and, and stuff like that. So we knew that, and we I wasn't frustrated by it. We just went. We just had to go where the fans were. But but touring in the early days, you want to talk about what that what that was like? Um, like, well, I know in the first we we toured a few times in your car. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, right. I don't, but that was the big tours. I don't think we did. We, didn't nah, we? so we, so the way we put the raw tour together, I think we did a run to like Texas and back. Yeah, okay. In the car, in like a regular car, in oh, like a sedan. Oh, and that was when Tech hit me up for Am I a Psycho? And then I flew back because I had to write my verse because right. I couldn't do it in the studio in Texas because I had writer's block. That <laughs> that was one that was one leg that was one leg of the tour. There was also a little a little battle you were involved in on that on that run too. Oh, Novi Novak. <laughs> oh yeah, Novi. No, hey, no, me and him, me and him are cool now. But yeah, no, right. shout out to Novi Novak. Yeah, I know. And I was stressed out. I'm not gonna lie, I was stressed. That man murdered. Uh, he murdered me with the stand uh, joint before we left. I was mad. I was uh, I was yeah, like I was so, fucked up. So there there was that run. We did a run like up the north like up up like the west coast all the way up to like portland but then there was like another run that we used a van that was when br came hoppa was with us yeah at that yeah time uh -huh. it was me you br hoppa and, and my brother yeah i remember that yep so at, at that time you know everybody's wearing multiple hats yeah like i'm driving to i'm taking buck boxes i'm uh -huh. selling merch fake security you guys <laughs> are doing you guys are getting i'm getting into it my brother you guys are this you know, four cats, five cats in a in a in a van. Um, you know, but we I feel like we had to do it. We had to prove to people that the that it, it wasn't just online. Like it yeah, wasn't yeah, just exactly. a, a buzz and, online. And but it, what did you how did you what did you feel about, you know, how how I organized the tour in the I, early day? I know you still had comments about later tours when we had yeah, a yeah. Bit more resources. But honestly, I but mean early days, what was that? When like? we were doing that, that was so foreign to me, just being out traveling and pulling up to venues and people even recognizing me. I felt really excited. Like there were I, I know like overall, like there was sometimes there were moments where I was drained and may have been tired or whatever. But overall, I was just intrigued by the the whole thing of like, damn, we're just traveling around the United States and people are coming out to these shows and knowing who we are and they're coming specifically for us and we're selling CDs and they're buying merch, wearing the, um, you know, the funk volume hoodies or shirts, whatever. And it was, I couldn't believe it. That's why I always used to hang out in the crowds because I felt like I had never like experienced that type of like love from people before. Like I felt like I was one for once, like somebody who was appreciated. So I felt, I was like, this is tight. Right. Yeah, so so I I mean I but yeah it, but it was it was a struggle though being in that van sleeping in the van for long hours driving to the next city and you know waking up early and doing whatever just it was pretty much just like a road trip but with music being done every night and staying in hotel rooms we all had to um, pair up in hotel rooms um, most of the time we didn't get our own room we all it was always. Uh, Sometimes we had to sleep in the same bed. <laughs> hey, things is rough. Things is rough in the beginning. I think a lot of Ooh, uh, artists on on the grind can can relate to that. We had to, yeah, that shit was funny. Do, that shit was funny. Do, oh man, do you remember? Like, so that there were two times. Like one time, I think it was in Texas, where you and I had um, 
I think I yelled at you for something and you yelled back. <laughs> it was I think it was in Texas. Um cuz I think what what folks need to understand is like I didn't again, I didn't necessarily want to be in the music industry and I came from the corporate world where like everything was like you're on time, you email people back, you call people like that's just the norm or you get fired, right? <laughs> like so I I'm not used to things not starting on time and yeah. things like that. So I want and I feel like our reputation is is super important. So I'm trying to get everywhere on time, even to like sound checks where maybe people won't even be there. Yeah. So I I'm, I probably am, you know, I guess it's anal if you're looking at it from a music industry perspective, but I think it's like super normal in the world that I came from. Yeah. But we did a meet and greet. It was in Texas, I think. I don't remember the right city, but it was a meet and greet. There wasn't that many people there. So I think you felt a little, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, right. if you even remember it. Um, I think you were just a little embarrassed because there wasn't that many people there. And you just left and went to the side of the building and just started skating. <laughs> <laughs> so there were Sounds like me. Yeah. So th that was the first time, like, because I was in there and I was like, where's Hot? But I didn't see you leave. And I went to the side of the building and I said, Todd, what the fuck are you doing? And then that that was like the first time I I, I didn't really cuss you. I could probably count you, on one hundred yeah. less than two fingers, probably two times or something that I actually cussed. But like and that's when you and I had a little back and forth. That was it. And then the other time that you got mad at me on that tour, uh, I don't know if you remember this conversation where I told I told you you weren't an MC. Uh, uh wait, was this <laughs> Wait, wait. This it, was in like I. It was somewhere in the was, northwest. Was this when you told me I was wait? But when you, well, I'm trying to remember because I I feel like I remember. Was this when we were talking about like, I guess when and when you said I wasn't an MC, was this were you referring to the type of rap that I do, or were you? Or was this? Nah. Or was, was this more like insult? I don't remember the, nah, the tone this, of the conversation. This was like the way I was. The way I was looking at it was. Um, you know, I wasn't a huge hip hop head coming up, but I was familiar with hip hop. My my brother was a huge like East Coast, like yeah, yeah. Das Effects, uh -huh. Wu Tang, whatever. But so they the the characteristics of an MC that I came to know, okay, yeah, and I yeah. know it changes over time. Is like somebody that just has the a component of it is somebody <laughs> that has the ability to just get on stage, yeah, and like rock the mic <laughs> at any time like they just they're just ready there's a fearlessness to it yeah that i did i've never seen you had like you you are definitely an mc in today's time like yeah but that wasn't the the fearlessness like you have to have a certain no no you're, like you're a, right a prep. I mean, yeah i mean yeah i i know what you're talking about from your perspective i can understand I wouldn't have said that. I mean, <laughs> so that, was, that was the other time I, you got I, mad at me. Yeah, that, yeah. No, I I can see why I would have gotten upset at that. Um, but uh, yeah. But back then, my confidence <laughs> on stage, because well, when we when we were doing that tour, I would just rap. I wouldn't. I didn't. I didn't like. I've learned to like the way I perform now. I you know I talk to the crowd. I engage with them. I understand. You know how moments are supposed to go if the music's on <clears throat> or off. But back then, it was just hit play, next song, da, 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 da. and I didn't, and there was nothing in between. So maybe you, from your perspective, you were just looking at it as like this man is not even engaging with the crowd, or and I, I can understand that because I wasn't. I just performed and got off, right. and or maybe I told him to put their hands up during some courses, but I didn't really like. I wasn't really there the way I should have been, but I had to learn that. I didn't know. So, but yeah. That yeah. comment. <laughs> yeah, so that was so that so that whole tour. I mean, it definitely. I think it was an eye opening experience for everybody. It was uncomfortable for everybody. I don't think people are just used to like being that in that close of quarters with people. Yeah, just driving around the country. And if you think about it, like we're taking we're taking some pretty big risks. Like we don't know these promoters from a can of paint. Mm -hmm. Like we got you know. screwed sometimes. <laughs> we not, but not much. Like we yeah. we pretty much collected on. You know, I would say ninety five plus percent of what we were supposed to collect yeah yeah right so i think we did i think we did a fairly good job given how you know novice we were yeah in the game definitely and i think it was important you know for us to do that i mean we even got out to australia um it was late 2011 september 2011 
with your boy with your boy Chitty Bang. Yeah, yeah, and Brian <laughs> Chitty. Shout out to Brian Chitty. So he, the, so the person that actually got us to to Australia for the first time wasn't even a promoter. He was just a fan. <clears throat> he was a butcher <laughs> turned promoter. Um, but he brought us out, and and you know. I think that just goes to like you just never know who your fans like what your fans will do and who your fans are. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, but we we I think we developed such a and we were known for being very interactive and engaging on on socials. So we just we figured it out and that's how we got to Australia for the first time. Yeah. So that was dope. We we came back. Um, so what was the next thing that kind of kind of moved the needle after after touring? From your we, perspective we came back from that tour i remember um what was it i was um i i was i wanted to do a, a, another ill mind of hobson mm -hmm. and that was that yeah so it was i i was like damn i wanted to come with another something to just keep things moving i know i had done a few ill minds i had done one two and three but i was like now that I've, i have a little buzz the um raw had dropped we've done a, a nationwide tour even yeah we i i needed something else that was going to show people that like um i guess the real deal so i did ilmana hobson four and that definitely um you know helped us a lot that that really blew up um i think that was the, at the time that was the biggest video for sure that was generating a lot of buzz mm -hmm. and then I know the Tech Nine collab um, had released later that year as well, 2011. Mm -hmm. And my psycho, yeah, yeah, in my psycho. And I know we were doing spot shows here and there throughout the rest of the year as well. Just right. going to, and we went to, we were always in Ohio. I just remember because I had so many. I had, I had met a lot of fans there that who had become friends, and we were just there all the time, like in Ohio, and I feel like Minnesota. Yeah. Yeah, those were those. I mean, we we had a pretty strong base in a lot of cities, but I would say, you know, definitely Denver, Ohio, Minneapolis, um, mm -hmm. and then like Portland, yeah, um, yeah, Seattle area. Those those were definitely strong early. At so up until this point, like what? Because I know you used to get on me about certain things, but what? Was there anything that frustrated you about what I was doing up until that point? Up until, besides getting us orange sweatshirts. Oh, I mean, yeah, the orange. <laughs> I didn't really like the orange. Um, but let me see. Um, you know, honestly, I mean, there there may have been things like little disconnects we had through our personalities and like stuff on tour, like what you said, like little small things of me going out skateboarding or or whatever type of petty issues that may have built up um i don't i don't recall anything that was massive during that time at the at, at at this point where i felt like oh fuck this um there was nothing that i that i can personally recall where i i felt like i was like done with you or done with everything anything like that of, of you know I, I was always going through something and my mind was my i, I felt like i was my own worst enemy so I did. I always felt like I was struggling with some type of misery or depression that was lingering over me that I was causing on myself that I was unaware of. And maybe that is, that may have caused me and you to bump heads at certain times. But I don't think, like I said, I don't think it was from my perspective, there was nothing that was that serious at that time. Yeah. No, I think, I mean, so the, or the orange was definitely yeah. my, like in my mind, just from a branding perspective, you know, I just wanted orange to be like identifiable with funk volume just from a branding perspective yeah and you know i think it was it wasn't very successful because i couldn't i couldn't get you guys to see what i would hope to see in embracing just the color having that be part of the brand yeah um you know did you have i know you made it would make a comment but did you have because we are from like i mean we're from the same place but we have we we have different perspectives. We have different types of friends. We have yeah. a different kind of just upbringing. Did you have an issue with me? Like just wear, cause I would wear the stuff all the time. Yeah. You know, I was just like, you know, I'll, <laughs> I'll wear it. Um, yep. I felt like you did have a little bit of an issue with me wearing the stuff. No. No? I had, a, I had an issue with me wearing it. 
That's, because that the was orange. A problem. That was a problem. For that me. was yeah. But that wasn't even just the orange. Like I had, and I mean, we could talk about that now. I had. Yeah. A, Go that ahead. was a problem for me that it was that so I, hard that to I get. wasn't wearing. Not even just the orange. I mean, this shit ain't orange. No, it I know, and no, and you're right. And I can break, and I and I see, I and I know why that happened. I can um, well, yeah, the orange. Yeah, I just never the orange thing. That, but aside from that, there was other merch that wasn't orange, and I didn't wear. I did not understand marketing from that angle. Like I do now because now with with uh, um that and that yeah, something I don't I don't ever see you without something is to say undercover. I know prodigy. I know that and, shit. And I was now, like this cat don't he, he don't take <laughs> undercover prodigy off. I couldn't I couldn't put him in anything funk volume. No, but here here's why here here's why. Um, I mean it's two different versions of me as a person with so the funk volume me and the undercover prodigy me, but. During Funk Volume, I felt like a lot of it, even though I come up with the name and I did I did make the logo, I um I sounds <laughs> I saw you every time I put it on. I felt like I was putting on a dame costume right. and I was like in the oranges and everything. So and I was like, this is not Hobson. Hobson, like I I I and I don't even know what Hobson really was, to be honest. Right. But I just there were certain things with maybe designs. I don't know. The, not the designs were cool. Not, not when I look back at it, it, it wasn't bad. Like it, I was maybe in my own head. It was a perception that I had, and yeah, I should have been wearing it more than I was, or I should have given input on more ideas or designs if I right. had a problem with it, and I did not do that. And my and so it resulted in me sometimes just being distant from the actual brand and never wearing it, then I'm just wearing everybody else's stuff, famous and this and that. Right. And yeah, and I, and I, but I, I just didn't understand. And I, and I also, you know, I guess from a business pers perspective, I didn't know the, the impact that my music w was making for the merch to, to help it. I just did. I thought that there right. was no, like, in, in my mind, I'm thinking like, let's just say just an example of, um, if my music is making a hundred thousand dollars, I'm thinking if if that many fans bought that much music, I'm thinking maybe only like twenty people are buying the shirts. But I didn't understand, right. and you know, in, until a few years down the road, where I was like, oh shit, when I wear that and I post that, that shit, like it's a different, and I and I just didn't, I didn't know that. Right, I never knew that. Yeah, no, nah, I mean, and we did, we did well in merch, but we yeah. could have done probably a million times better if I had a... <laughs> better than yeah. what we did if if cats em embraced, you know, the merch and to have the buy because if you, you know, I, I wanted you to let me know what you what you wanted me to put on a shirt, like I, yeah, because you know I understood that. But uh -huh. all right, well, cool. So where are we at now? Well, Ill so, mind drops. Yeah, so Ill mind goes four, crazy. Then, then few, then few I months later, psycho. Mi psycho. Yeah, and double then double XL cover. <clears throat> oh yeah, the double XL cover. Yeah, there are different kinds of therapists. Oh yeah. So mm -hmm. I have done. I have gone. There was a therapist in 2012 that I was seeing that I went to maybe about f five times. It was a, it was a guy, and he well, I was just talking about life and different things. He didn't put a mirror up to show me myself in such a way where I was like, holy shit. There's something like there's therapists who just listen and they go, well, maybe you know you should next time, you know, she should approach it. And then there's there's like fucking gurus out there that this is what I just tapped into over the past like year, year and a half or so. There's people out there who really will pick you apart to the core. Mm -hmm. And um, and this this happened mid last year, um, like summer 2019. 